it seems we can move a bit closer in this groundwork of understanding the nature of humility and seeing that each time we're humbled, there is present to some degree some unquestioned sense of confidence regarding the absolute final nature of our opinion or our interpretation or our conclusion about ourself, about another person, about God or anything whatsoever. That is, what gets humbled is the imagined finality of the truth that we had attained. And what's so humbling is not only that was what we attained not final, but what is more was hopelessly inadequate in doing justice to what the true nature of the situation or the true nature of ourself or the true nature of another person really is. If we could get to a place where we could cease all finality within ourselves, that is, all claims at having arrived at the final say of what we're capable of, the final say of what our life has in store, there would be nothing left in us to be humbled. And when there was nothing left in us to be humbled, we would be humble. And in being humble, we would be free from these imagined absolutes. In Thich Nhat Hanh's language, this is to realize that every view is wrong view when it's held as the only view that's the true view. There are those who hold that one religion is the true religion. And almost always when this occurs, the religion just happens to be their own. There is in the absoluteness of view a lack of humility which closes us off to the way God works in the hearts and the lives of other people in ways that are different than we are accustomed to. Humility liberates us from such notions. This is why humility is so paired up with wisdom, that the wise person is the humble person. They know so deeply because they know the limits of their knowledge. The limit is actually the rich, fertile edge along which all that is new keeps appearing. My father used to say that when he was young, he was surprised when he was wrong. And that as he got older, he learned to be pleasantly surprised when he was right. There's a certain freedom in the ability to have discovered that one was a little less than completely correct because it constantly helps us to remember that there is no closure, there is no finality to the end of the journey. I now at this point would like to address specifically the ways in which spontaneous contemplative experiences are inherently humbling. And this will then provide the basis for exploring humility as a path of self-transformation. To go back again to one of the examples that we have been using in the previous sessions. Imagine that you are going along absorbed in your worrisome ruminations. You turn to see a flock of birds descending, or you stand quietly watching children at play. And in a flash, the texture of your worrisome ruminations are rendered vacuous. You suddenly realize that the very texture of your consciousness was hopelessly impoverished with respect to the magnitude or the beauty to which you in this moment are being graced to realize. Once a woman on a retreat shared with the group that her mother died of cancer in a hospice. And as her mother's death approached, she told this 
one daughter of hers who was the woman on the retreat sharing this story, that she wanted her to bring her jewelry box from home. And so all the children gathered at the hospice and they propped her up in bed and they ceremoniously put the jewelry box on her lap and they opened the box for her. And reaching in, she would take out a piece of jewelry and hand a certain piece to this child and reaching in, hand the next piece to the next child and so on. And she kept doing that until she got to the point where she said, there, it's finished. The woman who was sharing this story was standing beside her mother, helping her do this, and looked in the jewelry box and saw there was still an emerald ring left in the box and said, look, Mom, you forgot this emerald ring. She said at that point, her mother reached out, took the ring out of her hand and said, oh, no, I just got that ring a week ago. I'm not giving that up. And she died that night. The woman who shared the story told the group, and she had tears in her eyes when she said it, that that moment of her mother saying that is a precious moment to her. Here her mother was, at the very edge of death, reaching out to take her ring back because she wasn't ready to give it up. And hours later, she died. The utter inability of the ego to manage the depths in which we find ourselves. Once giving a retreat to a community of sisters, they asked me if I would give a talk each day to the Golden Jubilarian sisters over in the infirmary. And I agreed to do that, and I would go over each day, and they would put their wheelchairs and so on in a circle. And I would sit there, and I would talk to these old women about how to be holy. And each afternoon, I would take a little walk in an apple orchard that were on the grounds of this convent. And one of the elderly sisters was being taken out for a little outing by one of the nurses. And we stopped to talk to each other because she recognized me from my daily talks. And this woman was maybe 90 years old or so. She was very badly crippled with rheumatoid arthritis. So crippled, in fact, she was not able to sit up. She was lying back in her wheelchair. We were standing there talking to each other, and she looked up at me, and she said, Mr. Finley, please pray for me, because I feel that God's about to ask some great thing out of me. Now, I can recall at one level what flashed through my mind was the thought, well, he better hurry up. I had this image of reaching down and putting my hand on her shoulder and saying, listen, old girl, I'm not so sure you grasp the situation. But she was right on the money. Death is a very great thing. And it was a contemplative experience for me to experience how precious she was and her fragility. The contemplative experience arises in all the fundamental arenas of human existence. That is, we could just as easily choose examples of contemplative experience in which we're humbled in the presence of nature, humbled in the presence of the beloved, humbled in the presence of prayer, in which we're given to realize that we're infinitely more than ego. But I think these examples relative to death help us be more keenly aware of how at some profound level This whole journey is about the resolution of the apparent obstacle of death. Meister Eckhart, in effect, says, What is the joy that death does not have the power to destroy, and how might I discover it? The contemplative path is a path in which we're given to realize the joy that death does not have the power to destroy. It doesn't have the power to destroy our joy because it's not a joy that's reducible to nor dependent upon ego effort, ego attainment, and all that I in my ego think and imagine myself to be. Now what's worth noting, I think, is that we do not mind being humbled in these moments. That is, In moments in which our heart is quickened, 
in a contemplative realization that reveals to us the radical poverty of egocentric consciousness. There are no complaints. There are no complaints because just as egocentric consciousness gives way, there is this groundswell of contemplative consciousness that lifts us up. The moment of being awakened is a moment of being awakened to that which you intuitively realize to be boundless. By boundless I mean that were you to try and draw a circle around that to which you've been awakened, that which has awakened you would playfully overflow the circumference of that circle. This is one of the most fundamental aspects of contemplative experience, is its boundless quality, its uncircumscribable nature, that nothing hems it in, and without effort it overflows all frontiers. And it's in this sense that I speak of contemplative experience as being transcendent. Then a moment of contemplative awakening, I turn to see a flock of birds descending, I see children at play, I am given to realize the poverty of all my thoughts and opinions about children, all my thoughts and opinions about birds descending, all my imagined importance about the problems of the day, that they all fall away like shadows. They appear as nothing, but they appear as nothing precisely because egocentric consciousness has been overwhelmed by a consciousness that transcends it. Hence, I'm not complaining about being humbled in the realization of the inadequacy of my egocentric consciousness. In fact, I'll take being humbled any day. This is exactly, in fact, how the woman spoke about her mother taking the emerald ring back. She said she found the moment to be disarming but disarming in some paradoxically rich way that she'll always be grateful for and that she'll never forget. If we do not mind being humbled in this way by these moments of spontaneous contemplative experience, it seems too that we can say that we do not mind being humbled by such moments as they pass and we return to customary ego consciousness. If it weren't for the illumination of these moments, we would go on unaware of the radical insufficiency of the finite. But having glimpsed directly for ourselves the infinity of life's concreteness, or having tasted directly for ourselves the generosity of God utterly given to us in and as life's concreteness. In that very granting and in the passing of the moment in which we were so awakened, we see for ourselves that going through our life unaware will never do. It's in the awareness of the insufficiency that we come upon the yearning or the ache or the desire to bring to fulfillment an awareness of the inherent holiness of life itself that never ends. When two people love each other very much, they are not content to just see each other time and again. As a matter of fact, it's like a tease. It's like so near yet so far away. When two people love each other very much, the heart asks for continual union and for continual oneness. And so when our heart is awakened by the infinite love that gives itself to us in and as birds descending, in and as children at play, how can we go around looking at just birds descending, looking at just children playing, knowing that we're not seeing the true stature and the true nature of these things and of everything around us, including ourselves. Now, if being humbled by moments of contemplative experience 
consisted of nothing other than being humbled in the ways that we've explored here so far, there truly would be no complaints about being humbled. It's like bring it on. The more frequently we could be humbled by moments of contemplative awakening, the more aware we could be of our unawareness and the more the yearning for an ever more abiding contemplative awareness would grow within us, the happier we would be. What's not so easy to take, however, is all the ways in which the heart's yearned for fulfillment is a long time coming. What is more, and this deepens the nature of humility with respect to contemplative experience, is I realize not just that I'm estranged from this awareness, but that I cling to the estrangement. That I flee from my heart's desire. I see this in therapy sometimes and with clients who so want something very much. They want some fulfillment, they want some intimacy. But when they look at it real, real close, they can see the ways that they subtly sabotage what would open up or possibly lead to what they desire. Merton writes, God cannot plant his liberty in me because I am a prisoner and I do not even desire to be free. I love my captivity and I imprison myself in the desire for the things that I hate and I have hardened my heart against true love. I must learn, therefore, to let go of the familiar and the usual and consent to what is new and unknown to me. I must learn to leave myself in order to find myself by yielding to the love of God. If I were looking for God, every event and every moment would sow in my will grains of his life that would flourish in me. 